All right. Anybody superstitious? Hopefully not. As we get out there, have a fear of bad luck. What about things like Friday the 13th or the bad luck number four, bad luck colors, white or black, crossing a, bl a black cat crossing your path, seeing an owl, turtles, lucky rabbit's feet, horseshoes over a door, broken mirrors as a gift, uh, giving a mirror as a gift, spilling salt, throwing salt over your shoulder, uh, not washing your jersey till after playoffs. That one hits a little closer to home for some people. No umbrellas inside the house or no umbrellas as a gift. Knock on wood, cross your fingers, lucky pennies, lucky prime numbers, bad luck numbers come in, bad luck comes in threes, four leaf clovers, 666, reading your horoscope. In India, people actually, there are a group of people who actually sweep, they walk around with a broom and they sweep in front of them because they don't want to step on uh, an insect, even an insect that you can't see, and maybe it, that killing that insect would impact their karma in a negative way. So they walk around everywhere they go sweeping the floors. A missionary I met from Papua New Guinea said he was told that he should be ashamed of imposing his culture on these tribal native people. And his answer was that the tribal people had been living, walking around in fear because in their village, if you step on the house of a demon as you're walking through the woods or if you uh, insult an ancestor accidentally, you can make them angry. And so they were living trapped in their fear. And he said that he serves these people, these tribal people, because Christ comes to set them free and gives them freedom from the bondage that they have to fear. 65% of Americans are superstitious. Does that surprise you? Some of those things, um, so it doesn't sound superstitious until you get into jerseys and lucky numbers and lottery and stuff like that. Then it's like, oh, maybe, 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 right? Some people don't even step outside their house until they read their horoscope in the morning. Sometimes things uh, just seem to be rotten luck, and sometimes they seem to be orchestrated by some deity that just doesn't like you. And um, even in other religious systems, fate itself is cornerstone to Hindu or to Islam. Uh, karma is foundational to both Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, luck is a common greeting when you see someone, right? Good luck. Think about it. Good luck, you know, as you go. So as we talk about Bullet Train, it is an R-rated movie, and I need to warn you about it. I usually don't often do that, but it's hard to get around. It's like everything's R-rated these days. It's number one in the box office since it was released a couple weeks ago. It's about a an agent, James Bondish kind of guy who's hired to do a job. He's had a string of bad luck you saw in the trailer uh, where even if he's not sent to kill someone, someone dies and people keep dying. And so he takes a time out. He goes and sees a therapist. He tries to mellow out and, and try and find a way to, to get beyond that. And uh, as he's coming back slowly back into uh, his job, he's given a simple uh, what do they call that um, smash and grab job and um, the problem is his bad luck seems to continue to follow him as he comes back and so this movie is all about luck and faith and it is dripping it is so obvious that this is what the movie is about um, they have little subliminal things they have even the the uh, makeup and the the clothes that they wear uh, it's hidden within all of those kinds of things. Comicbook.com says Bullet Train walks a fine line between letting its characters have good luck and bad luck and chalking things up to fate. Is it no, there's no sex in the movie. Thank you. But um, there, it's R-rated because of language and because of violence. Um, and um, it's kind of cartoonish violence. Uh, you know, it's, it's eh, so, yeah. Pop Sugar says that even the hair and makeup and the tattoos in the movie, even the fingernail styles have meanings in this movie. So that's how deep this goes. Brad Pitt, the main character, is given the code name Ladybug because ladybugs are seen to be good luck and counteract his long string of bad luck that he's had before. I'd like to hear what his, his old code name was. At the end of the movie, uh, we're told that what appears to be bad luck to him is actually good luck because those who believe in luck and that ladybugs are luck also believe that the seven black dots on the ladybug are the seven sorrows of humanity and that ladybugs absorb the sorrows of humanity so other people around them can have good luck. So really the fact that he's in the midst of this bad luck is because he's, he's helping other people not to suffer bad luck. Does that make sense? 
I don't know. It's luck. I'm not. I'm not a pro at that. So I'm just trying to explain it. So the movie's based on a Japanese book that has a lot of luck symbols from other cultures, uh, including the the ladybug seven sorrows thing is actually a Roman Catholic thing. Uh, and so two of the characters in the book are in the movie are named Tangerine and Lemon. People ask why, and there's never a clear answer except if you if you dig in and find out why. Tangerines and oranges. Um, show up all over this movie. They'll just randomly be something in a tangerine or roll across the screen, and you're like, why is that there? What they're saying is pay attention. Th this is, we want you to pay attention. So what do tangerines mean? Tangerines and oranges uh, are uh, Chinese symbols of luck because the word tangerine sounds like the Chinese word for luck, and orange sounds like the Chinese word for wealth. And so the skin, the gold color, also symbolizes um, gold or financial luck. And tangerines are given as a sign of abundance, happiness, and prosperity. It's very common to take miniature trees and give them as gifts or plant them in front of your doorways, especially around the New Year's. But I'm told, this is an interesting thing, don't eat the tree, uh, the fruit of a tree that's specifically, because in order to get them to have the fruit at the Chinese New Year, they have to give them so many fertilizers that the fruit actually isn't good to eat. Did anybody know that? I didn't know that. So... Tangerine lemon. So lemon is the twin brother. They're twins. Can you tell? So they're twins, and um, that is never explained in the movie. It is questioned, but is never explained in the movie. Lemons are believed to ward off negative energy, and lemon trees are also planted in front of a house and are placed in water by the front door. Chinese lore says that if you place seven or nine, specifically lemons in a bowl, and place it in the southwest corner of the kitchen, it will attract positive energy. It's also a symbol of abundance because usually f trees, lemon trees are full of abundance. And it was a Roman symbol of abundance and uh, a wealthy person because they came from the, the East and only wealthy per people had them in the Roman Empire. So Brad Pitt's character believes, he says specifically, I have biblically bad luck. Did you know that's a phrase? I didn't know that there was such a thing as biblically bad luck. I think they're talking about um, Job specifically. But um, biblically bad luck is something that seems to be you have such a bad streak of luck that it seems like some deity is up there just like focusing his negative energy on you and choosing your fate. Fate is basically, can you escape your fate? There's, here's a couple quotes from the movie. Fate has made us all, and we all end up in the same train by luck. My son, you cannot control what fate has in store for us. I do not need anything. Fate will do what it will. Fate is another word for bad luck. If, if fate wills it, I will have victory. Nothing in life it is an accident. If you don't control your faith, fate, it will control you. And our paths are destined to reach each other. Does that sound like the faith that you've heard people talk about in culture? It totally is. Yep. All right. So no matter what you do, fate is you're going to, you can't change it. Even if you try to change it, the thing that you chose to change is actually the thing that's going to get you to the place you're supposed to be in the first place. So you can't control, you can't manipulate your faith. And this whole movie is about how these crazy, unrelated, seeming like side stories end up in the exact same place at the exact same time and you just go whoa how did they all end up here in the first place and there's nothing that you can do to escape what fate is going to do to you one of the characters says maybe there is no good luck or bad luck maybe we are all just agents of fate so what we do actually impacts someone else's fate along the way if there is a personal God in the idea of fate system and you have some bad things happening to you, it's because that God doesn't really care for you. One of the characters says, I missed my stop because God hates me. Right? There's this idea that that's your fate is because God hates you. So what does the Bible talk about love or uh, luck and fate? So there are superstitions that are mentioned in the Bible. In 1 Samuel, we learned about um, that when the Ark of the Covenant was put in the temple of Dagon, that God Dagon fell over and his hands were cut off. And so second, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 9 says, Yahweh says, I will punish everyone who leaps over a threshold. Why are they leaping over the threshold? The Philistines became superstitious about the threshold because if it can cut off the hands of your God, then maybe it can cut off your feet or whatever touches it as well. Ezekiel 13 talks about people that hunt down other souls by using magic bands on their arms and using veils over their heads. So God clearly condemns superstitious, idolatrous worship 
uh, Deuteronomy. There's a bunch of lists. There's a, a bunch of uh, passages on the, the screen. And the only reason I say this is because I it's this is such a serious thing that I think that that we need to address how some of these little tiny things that we do in our lives that we may just think are just little things. Those superstitious things are really angles in our life that Satan uses to get in there. So Deuteronomy. Uh, has a bunch of passages, 2 Chronicles 33, Isaiah 47, Acts 19, Revelations uh, 9 and 21. Anything where in, you are putting your fate or your decisions in the, the hands of some star or an object, a horoscope, tea leaves in a cup, anything like that, anything like that can become, uh, as Scripture says, is forbidden. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive, by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human traditions, you understand that? Human traditions, according to the elementary spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And sometimes, you know, something happens and we just want to, you know, God's, God's testing me on that. Well, that's not it either. That's, the, you know, that's not fate as well. James chapter 1 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed by their own desire. So you're not being tempted. That's not just, you know, God has orchestrated your life and whatever's going on is because God is trying to, to test you. We come back to what we said earlier in the four G's. God is great, so I don't have to be in control, right? Scripture says that because God loves you and he's personally involved in each one of our lives, we don't have to worry about good luck. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says, uh, talks about that we have been chosen. God has chosen us according to his purposes. I have a couple verses for you to look at together in discussion groups. So um, I have uh, three passages. So we're, we're less broke up than we were last week. So um, I, I need a group to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Those are the passages on the screen. You got it? You got a bunch of Ephesians 2ers? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quiz you on this afterwards. You're going to talk about it. So Psalm 37. How about another group of people do Psalm 37? These are all in you version too as well. And then Matthew 29 verses 29 through 31. 10, 29 to 31. Yeah. All right. Go ahead and look at those for a couple minutes. I'm going to come back and I'm going to quiz you. What do these passages say to you about you and fate? one you took? Okay, you only had to do one verse, so it shouldn't take that long. All right? You got it? How about my Ephesians 2 people? What does it say, say to you about fate? Another minute? Okay. Is that good? Better? All right. 
Ephesians 2, people. What'd you get? We were by faith. Yeah, right? Beforehand, before you were born. Why do I have freckles? Why do I have curly hair? Why do I am so skinny? Why am I so tall? Why am I? It, all that was planned beforehand. None of it was an accident, all right? Psalm 37. Who else? Who had, right? God establishes. What's your, what, what else is in there? What's the second part of that? Yep. So, right. So, so there's a partnership, right? It's not just God. God does. God hasn't. So that's what fate would say is that there's a God who's ordained everything in your life. But this passage says that when we delight in his way, so we have a choice in that, right? There is a choice in how we walk. If we will walk in his way, that's when the blessings and stuff, if we don't, it goes in the other direction. So this, our steps are established. They're firm when we delight in his way. All right, good. Matthew 10. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, love that. Yep. So, so yeah, because some people just dutifully obey God's word, but this says we delight. It's the person who delights in it that does it with joy. Okay. All right. Who else? Anything else on that passage? Yeah. chose it to happen right yeah yeah so the hairs in your head what is that so what does that mean to you personally so sometimes I think we think that God loves us God so loved the world right he loves everybody we forget that he loves me and this passage says that God specifically, he knows the details of you, every you that's here, every person that's here. So it's not just that God has orchestrated the plans of the world and is also he's working in your life. And you're absolutely right. He didn't orchestrate for bad to happen for you, but we're going to see this later. He will use what's bad for your good, right? If you choose, what did the verse say before him? If you delight in his way, you can choose. So every time something happens to you, you have a choice. You can allow yourself to continue to be a victim or you get to be victorious over it. I watched a news program one time and it was a, a woman in England who a murderer was being released that had killed her father. And the news reporters, of course, came out, stuck the microphone. What do you feel? How do you feel? How do you? He's like, she said, I, I don't feel anything. She says, that man took away my father, my, my mother's husband, my, my sister's uh, father as well, my kid's grandfather. Um, we will not continue to allow that man to to victimize us. We've released that. They've moved beyond. They had been able to forgive them. So you have a choice as you go through whatever it is you go through, if you're going to become a victim or if you're going to be victorious over it. That's the choice that you walk to. And that's where it goes, where when you delight in his way, right? He has orchestrated even the bad things that happen to you. He can turn them for good. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Anything else in the Matthew 10? Yeah. Yeah. He's updated. He's, uh, he's, he's current. Yeah, that's good. All right. You w N nothing happens, Lois said, outside the Father's will. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
Lord, you ordered my footsteps. Yep. 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 Yeah. Well, that's what makes a difference, right? I, and that's why it's important that his name is Yahweh, the God who always was and always, always will be the same. Because you know that he can still be counted on now in the midst of your current trial in the way that you saw him respond to David or to Jonah or to Job or, you know, whoever. He is the same God who always was and always will be the same. So you can trust in his word and, and who he is and what his reaction will be in your life because his name is his promise. Anybody else? Yes, exactly. So, but, so these passages say that we're chosen, but being chosen, again, I think I mentioned that earlier, is not the same as fate. Fate is the belief that no matter what you do, that no matter what happens, you're going to still end up in the same place. And the, the, whatever fate is that chose for you to be in that place, whether it's a personal or non-personal source of fate, they have, they don't really care about you. They just have this, you know, they may just be playing with you or whatever. One man in the movie says, Waturo, you was lucky. You never know what your bad, what bad luck your fate has saved you from. Uh, maybe because you had bad luck and got a flat tire, you didn't get into an accident or something. You were not saved in, in, in the, when you believe in fate, you're not saved because of this good benevolent being. You're saved because the bene that being or that whatever fate is has some other purposes that you're going to die from anyway. And that's not it. So. So being chosen or predestined means that you can participate with God the way it w in Scripture. It means we get a choice. That verse says when we walk according to his plan, because you choose uh, to walk his path. So what do we do when you feel like you're in a series of unfortunate events or when you're in a just a time of really bad, bad, bad luck? And uh, how do we respond in, in that? Uh, first of all, I would never say you're in a string of you're having a string of really bad bad luck um, It may be unfortunate events, but it's not bad luck Romans chapter 8 verse 12 says so then brothers and sisters We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you live according to the flesh You will die But if by the spirit you will put to death the deeds of the body and you will live letting your life be controlled by superstition is allowing is letting the flesh control you and it's slavery for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons and daughters, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Do you know it's okay to cry to the Father, help me? He really wants you to cry that way, as any father would. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We talked about what it means to be heirs last week. So if you want to talk about that, that was um, the movie that we talked about that last week. And if you are a child, then what do you do when things turn south on you? When just the everything seems to be going down the drain? Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing, revealing uh, the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from the bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The whole creation is from the beginning of time been under the burden of the curse. And all of those nature channels do you watch animals killing each other that's creation groaning under the curse of, of what is out there it's ugly it's nasty it's not the way god planned it to be in the first place and it's groaning waiting as much as you have been waiting creation has been waiting so much longer for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until, until now and not only the creation but we ourselves we have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoptions as sons and daughters the redemption of our bodies we don't get it yet we still get cancer we still get sick we still get covid we still get heart disease we still need colonoscopies all those kind of things because we have not fully received our full inheritance yet but it's coming it's coming for in this hope we were saved now hope that is seen is not hope 
for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait in patience. But I'm in so much pain. I don't even know how to pray in the midst of this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought to, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words, and he searches our hearts, knowing what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. But everything seems so out of control. I don't know how to, it just seems like everything goes wrong. Verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Will you circle the all things first? Highlight it if you've got your digital Bible, whatever it is that you've got in front of you. All things work together. That means the cancer. That means the sickness. That means the financial troubles. That means that whatever it is that's going in your life, all things work together for good. You may not see it now because remember, God never doesn't answer prayers. He always answers prayers. It's yes, you get it, what you're asking for later, or I've got something better. It's never no. Yes, later, or better. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Somehow, somehow, that's what we believe because we trust in his name as Yahweh. Somehow he's going to turn these things around for good. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among brothers and sisters. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Who did all that work? Does it say you predestined yourself? No, you called yourself. No, you justified yourself. You glorified. No, no. God did all of this stuff. God is great, so I don't have to be in control. That's what we believe. And when we hit these spots, that's when the rubber meets the road about what we believe and if it's really true. Doesn't mean it doesn't suck. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Doesn't mean we don't cry. Doesn't mean we don't yell, maybe even cuss sometimes. Doesn't mean that stuff isn't true, but it still means it's still true that God is great, so I don't have to be in control. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah, yeah, but how far is God willing to go for you? How far is he willing to go? The cross, right? He sent his son. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Remember that verse back there, all things will work together? Here it is. He will give us all things who shall be who shall bring charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is going to condemn you? Christ is the one who died. More than that, he was the one who was raised. He was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Then who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any else in anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. How far is God willing to go for you? To die on the cross, infinity and beyond. So now what? What am I so do, supposed to do if my horoscope says it's bad, it's going to be a bad day? or a cat crosses my path on the way to work, or two bad things have happened already, that means another one's coming. I, I just got to, do you cross your fingers? Do you throw salt over your sugar? Do you knock on wood? Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive with philosophies and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elementary spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. We're not slaves, folks, to, to fate, we're not slaves to fear. We're not slaves to luck, you know, rolling the dice, throwing the, you know, whatever it is. We're not slaves to those things. Since you were dead in your transgressions, transgression, trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made, alive, made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the debt that has stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside and nailed it to the cross. You ever had a demerit when you were in high school or ever get written up by your teacher and you had to go to the principal's office? That little ticket that he would give you? That's exactly what he's talking about here. Some more than others. Mike just had his reunion. They brought a, They had a collection of them. 
that's what he's talking about here. These spiritual leaders are writing these demerits against people. And Jesus says, guess what? I took all of them and nailed them to the cross. There's not a demerit left that can hold you down. There's nothing left to enslave you. There's nothing left to control you. There's nothing, no weight left on your shoulders because it's all been nailed to the cross. And these human leaders that, that, that wrote those things that were trying to use them to manipulate and control you, what happened to them? Verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them through him. Literally, the verse says they were stripped naked and made to walk through the streets. I mean, that's the, the emperor's clothes are naked. He's, he's got nothing. Therefore, since they are naked, they have nothing. Like, who's left? Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink with regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are the shadow of things to come, but a substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism or the worship of angels or your horoscope or astrology or rolling of dice or whatever it is. Going in on it about the details about visions puffed up without reasons by his sensuous mind, not holding to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with, with a growth that is from Christ. Here's, here's what he's saying. He said, when you do those things, you've forgotten who your head is. Your head is Jesus. And if Jesus is your head, you don't need any of this other stuff in your life. Here's the bottom line, verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of this world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to these regulations and superstitions like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and the severity to the body, but they are no value. There's a, another one to highlight. They're no value in stopping the adult indulgence of the flesh. How did you receive Christ in the first place? If you go back into the Colossians and read the whole context of this passage, there's these people that were trying to manipulate and control people with these demerits, basically trying to say, yes, it's you accepted Jesus, but now you got to do this. And so Paul's question to them is, is that how you received Christ? Is that how you came to Christ? Because if that is, that's the path you need to live on. But you didn't. You came to Christ through faith. And so we walk in faith by grace. So how do we then live our lives beyond this? Not by superstition, not by all these other things, not in fear, not by luck, not by faith. Just know that as we walk with Jesus, there is a Father in heaven who loves us, and seated next to him is his Son who died for us, and he sent his Holy Spirit to live within us so that we can be those people that he's called us to be, so that we don't need to walk in fear, don't need to worry about if we're stepping on demon houses or spirit houses or, you know, in uh, uh, making an ancestor mad or any of that kind of stuff. We walk in grace and hope and peace. In the name of Jesus, Father, thank you for giving us the ability to worship together this morning. Thank you for your word and the comfort that it is that we don't have to fear, but we can walk with you in hope and joy and peace. In your son's name we pray. Amen.